All right, coming up next is uh, something that I think a lot of people have been waiting for. Um, you know, this is uh, Nick Saponaro from Divi uh, talking about mastering masternodes, as uh, everybody probably already knows. Um, Divi is uh, one of the top couple uh, masternode projects in the space, in the crypto space. We're huge fans of everything they're doing. They've had uh, tremendous growth, a lot of which is just organic because uh, Nick just has uh, this great presence and is a great representative of Divi. He's out there everywhere uh, preaching the gospel of blockchain and uh, master nodes and uh, all the stuff that they're doing is really exciting. So with that said, Nick, I'm going to pass it over to you. And thanks again for joining us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for that uh, wonderful intro. I wish I could take full credit for our recent success, but uh, it, it really is a testament to our entire team. And um, it is, it's been mind boggling to me that, that we've seen this kind of growth uh, with basically no marketing. It's all just organic grassroots uh, development. So um, thank you though for, for saying that. And I'm really excited to be here to speak to everyone today about masternodes. Masternodes to me are, are probably one of the most uh, important features of building our network. Uh, and we will talk about that a lot today. Um, let me get my screen share rolling here. So um, as Jeremy introduced, I'm Nick Saponaro. I am the chief information officer of the Divi project, which is a cryptocurrency and blockchain startup that is aimed at making, earning, transacting and spending cryptocurrency accessible to everyone worldwide. Today we'll be talking about masternodes and the importance of earning a passive or active income in a recession. And before we get into masternodes and all the blockchain stuff, I just want to give a little precursor on exactly what a recession is. I think there's probably a lot of misconceptions about exactly what a recession is. Uh, and let's clarify that, right? So if you look at a textbook answer, it'll say, you know, it's a short term, usually a two or three month decline in an economy. But there are so many things that lead up to the recession that signal that it's going to happen. Um, and one of the most clear and usually earliest indicators of that is the yield curve inversion. And really that just means long-term debt instruments are yielding uh, lo lower returns than short-term debt instruments, uh, which damages investor confidence um, and creates all sorts of interest rate um, cuts and hikes depending on the length of the debt instrument. Um, of course, unemployment is a huge uh, factor in a recession. We've seen 22 million Americans unemployed over the past few months. A lot of people say that that is due to COVID-19. Uh, I disagree. I think COVID-19 was probably a catalyst um, and definitely obviously unemployed more people than uh, would have been unemployed potentially, but nevertheless, not the only cause. Um, we've already saw, you know, stagnating middle class incomes. In fact, a lot of people think the middle class is disappearing. Um, that is a huge factor in how recessions start to develop. We've, we've, we're starting to see contracting GDP. I think it was JP Morgan Chase, uh, or maybe it was Goldman Sachs, one of the big firms, thinks that we'll see like a 32% uh, reduction in GDP over the next couple of years, which is actually very, very significant. Um, and will cause a worldwide recession, not just a U.S. recession. Um, we're si we saw a lot of stock market volatility, right? In the beginning of um, the pandemic starting, there was a ton of, of volatility, and now it's, it's booming because of several factors, um, one of which is printing trillions of dollars and pumping it into those markets. Um, and, and you have to understand, like, the, the stock market is soaring right now artificially, it, it is partially the, the trillions of dollars of st stimulus money, some of which is going into the stock market um, and, and long-term equities and things like that. Um, but there's also this retail boom going on right now, somewhat spearheaded by apps like Robinhood, which are allowing Main Street investors, retail investors, to trade what are called CFDs, which are not actual ownership of stocks, but really just contracts. Um, and they're allowing people to trade on margin and it's incredibly dangerous. Um, and it's going to cause a lot more volatility in the long term. Um, even though a lot of people are making money right now, that's kind of 
it's actually a lot like the 2017 bull run in crypto. You could throw your money almost at anything and it would return a massive profit for you. Seeing companies like Hertz, which are bankrupt, pumping in the stock market is a huge indicator of uh, an inflated and artificial market. Um, the trillions, of course, going to other things uh, like uh, outside of just payroll and things that actually influence the economy. I mean, yeah, they gave everyone uh, who makes less than 100K, 1200 bucks, but that's not really a major influence on the economy. They also sent billions of dollars to a bunch of dead people. We won't talk about that too much, though. <laughs> Oil prices went negative a couple of months ago, uh, which is, again, a huge indicator that something is wrong. And it's all just consumed by this massive worldwide pandemic. It's not a great current state of affairs, especially when you start to look at historic information, right? So you have uh, unemployment at the highest level since the Great Recession. Um, even in the Great Depression, you know, in the, in the early part of this chart here, where it was, you know, 23 or 24%, a lot of those people that were considered to be unemployed were actually doing what are called make work jobs, which is basically a job that the government provides that was uh, assisting in whatever uh, rationing or, you know, um, supplying things to uh, soldiers or what have you. Um, they were still working technically, but they were considered unemployed. So I, I'm guessing that the number of unemployed people right now, which is around 22 million. It might've gone down actually a little bit since some economies are reopening. Regardless, it's probably somewhat close to what it was during the Great Depression. Um, and even before all of this was happening, we had this, as I mentioned before, declining or disappearing middle class. Most people in this country were un are unable to afford an unexpected bill of $400. $400 could literally bankrupt the average person. Um, that's, that's a long-term effect that we're not going to, going to see until the recession is really, really uh, affecting the economy, but that is still looming in the background. Now we are starting to see some of the economies, state economies reopening, and we already are seeing some better employment numbers, but we're not seeing an instant recovery necessarily in the economies. I mean, a lot of companies are still filing for bankruptcy, restructuring their organizations, and getting rid of a lot of people to try to prepare for the essentially the inevitable uh, what's coming. And we're also seeing a major change in the way that we live and work. So we already have seen that automation is basically a guarantee. <laughs> you know, the, the sort of manual jobs or, or um, jobs in, in warehouses, even driving trucks and things of that nature are probably going to be the first to be fully automated. We already have self-driving cars um, and they're working on self-driving um, freight. So we'll probably see those jobs disappearing and those are the middle class jobs. Um, and now we're also seeing a change in our society where we're working from home. I mean, most companies right now are, are still remote. I can tell you that most major organizations will stay remote probably into uh, fall, if not into 2021, uh, which says a lot, right? They're going to they're gonna be analyzing their uh, personnel and, and wondering how many of these people do we really need? There's a lot of people that work specifically in these office buildings uh, that may or may not be necessary anymore, especially if these companies tend to trend towards uh, more remote working schedules. So we have to consider all these things. And we have to consider the fact that the Federal Reserve is just printing absurd amounts of money out of thin air. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it, it is scary, right? Um, it's just propping up and prolonging what has been coming for a really long time. And if, if we follow the trend, the historic trend of recessions, we are in one now, right? Even if it's the textbook answer, it's been two or three months of decline. But if you go back to uh, the 2008, the Great Recession, the yield curve inverted in 2006, and it took a while for obviously what happened in 2008 to happen, but they did similar things where they were trying to pump the uh, stimulus money into the markets, into long-term bonds and things like that. And it doesn't work. It works in the short term, but eventually you can only print yourself out of trouble for so long before it catches up with you. 
So is it, is it all doom and gloom? Are we just screwed? I don't think so. Um, I'm a realist, right? But I, I do have a sense of optimism. And I believe that we basically have a couple of choices. You can rely on them to keep sending us $1,200 checks or printing money or pretending that they're helping us, or you can rely on yourself. And I think a sense of self-reliance is really important, especially at this time in our history. And I think that even before all of COVID and all of the uh, recession indicators, we were starting to see a trend toward self-reliance or at least partial self-reliance, right? If you look at the gig economy, the gig economy is still pretty massive. 57 million American workers were participating in the gig economy before COVID. And it's probably a similar amount now. Maybe more people are going to things like Fiverr, Upwork and things of that nature. But Grubhub, Lyft, Uber, TaskRabbit, all these things allowed people to take control of their schedule, of earning their money, kind of write their own check to some extent. And that level of adoption is really encouraging to me as somebody who creates software that enables individuals to take control of their finance because it shows that people do care about and understand that they can do this alone. And people are starting to realize how valuable their time is. If I work at a company, you know, five days a week, 40 hours a week, am I getting all the value out of that company that I can? And I'm not just talking about money. It's your freedom. It's your happiness. It's the way that you live your lifestyle, right? Why are we trading all of this time for an income that doesn't provide all the full scope of lifestyle that we deserve and want? And we're also seeing more and more entrepreneurs. A lot of people, you know, they do gravitate toward the gig economy, but a lot of people try to start their own business as well. You have Shark Tank really influencing people to try to get their own businesses off the ground. But unfortunately, a lot of people really aren't cut out to be entrepreneurs. Being an entrepreneur means more than 40 hours a week, trust me. Uh, it means dealing with all of the problems that your boss and your boss's boss and his boss's boss deal with all yourself. There are a lot of caveats to being your own boss. So not everybody does well at that. And only about 3% of people who start their own business succeed. So that's why it's so important to look at forms of passive or active income. And there is a big difference. There's a reason I've crossed out passive here because there are very few actual forms of passive income. I'm going to explain the difference. So passive income is where you have no material participation in the business whatsoever. Um, you, like a, a rental property, for example, all you did was provide a space for people to live. They kind of live there. Um, and even then sometimes you have to, you know, replace the water heater and things of that nature. Passive income is really what investors do. They just give money to entrepreneurs and their hands off. Most things are active income where you actually do have some material participation in the business. Um, and that could be as uh, small as running software like a Bitcoin miner um, or a master node. So in the crypto economy, there are several ways of making income, some passive, some active, and some just directly basically working. One that is essentially working would be trading. And I'm not trying to deter anyone from trading. If you're already a trader, more power to you. I'm not a trader. I'm a guy that just likes to buy and hold and, and you know, invest in good projects. Trading can be incredibly difficult. You're, you're competing against some of the most complex quant algorithms on earth, high frequency trading bots and things of that nature. If you're just sitting at your computer trying to make trades up and down or, or time the market, you might do okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's more akin to gambling that way. If you're not, if you're not like programming really high tech bots, mining is another way that you can earn money with crypto. The investment is kind of high initially. You have to purchase a bunch of hardware and you have to maintain that hardware. It can be complex and the hardware does tend to um, go into obsolescence pretty quickly. I think you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's like every six months or something, uh, the Bitcoin miners have to swap out their hardware, which can be kind of a big deal and it's expensive. In my opinion, the best way to earn um, active income with crypto is staking and with masternodes. 
staking is essentially running, uh, running a program that contributes blocks to the blockchain. Um, so it's doing the same thing as mining where it's basically trying to solve a complex uh, hashing algorithm. Um, and instead of running a um, hardware machine, you're running, uh, you're just basically allocating funds to the network. You're not really running any hardware. You do have to have a computer, of course, uh, but it doesn't require a massive investment in, you know, mining equipment, upgrading that equipment, et cetera. You just basically put your money into the system and let the computer do the work for you. It's pretty hands off and it can be run on pretty much any server, Raspberry Pi, Air, uh, MacBook Air, whatever. Um, and master nodes are the same way, but instead of adding blocks to the chain, they're validating the transactions in those blocks. I'll go a little bit deeper now, since this is a master node pres presentation into exactly what master nodes are and how they function. Um, so it's very simple. Master nodes are just a full node carrying a copy of the blockchain that verify and secure the network's transactions. Um, it, I'll break it down a little further, right? So somebody, let's call it Alice, requests a transaction. That transaction is broadcast to the network and the staking nodes are basically the ones that get it first. Um, they essentially uh, de determine whether or not that transaction should go into the chain and they send it to the master nodes who validate the transaction. Uh, it's like a second layer of, of validation essentially. And once it's verified, all of the transactions in that block go into the blockchain. And that's how blockchains work. It's uh, pretty simple. And really all you need to know is this part here <laughs> at the beginning and this part here at the end. And if you feel like this guy, it's okay. Most of us do when we first learn about this stuff. I mean, I'm still learning every single day, new things about this industry. You can never really be fully caught up. All you need to know is that masternodes are programs. And what they do is you allocate your money to it. It runs in the cloud or on your PC and you make money from it. Why would you do this? Why would you run a masternode? It's a way to support your favorite crypto or blockchain networks and earn active income for doing so. Very, very easy way to earn rewards. So if it's that easy, why is everyone not doing this? Well, it's not that easy. <laughs> In the past, masternodes have been incredibly difficult to set up. Even for developers like myself, it can take hours and hours of sifting through outdated documentation and trying to get servers configured in the, just the right way in order to get your masternode running. I mean, even some of the biggest coins in the ecosystem warn people that it can be hard work. If you don't know Putty and Linux, you shouldn't even try, you know, take into consideration all of the difficulties and then maybe you could think about possibly, <laughs> it's not really accessible to the average person is my point, which is why we created our system, which is essentially a one-click masternode. And this video will take you through exactly how it works in our wallet. You just click the button. As long as you have enough funds in the wallet, you can subscribe via PayPal or your credit card, which our friend here is going to do for you. Once you are logged in and pay, it's a monthly subscription of 10 or $15, depending on the level of masternode that you deploy. All you have to do is name your node, which he's not very creative. He just called it copper node setup. That's it. You click the button and it deploys in the cloud for you. It takes about 15 minutes after you click the button and then you can start earning crypto from there on out. Sounds really awesome, right? And I would totally love to recommend that you buy Divi and get into our ecosystem. We'd love to have you as part of our community, but I really do recommend that you do your own research. And while you do so, you focus on the fundamental basis of each of these coins that you're researching. I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about how I make my determinations on which coins to invest in. And you can take that and, and kind of build your own strategy based on that. The first thing you have to look at is the team. Is the team anonymous and behind the shadows or are they active and public and going on coin genius collective intelligence to tell you about their projects uh do they have a community right is it active and welcoming or is it just a bunch of bots 
chatting with one another ad nauseum. You want to make sure that you talk to people in that community, not the admins, not the team members, but the actual individuals who are using the software, because they can tell you everything you need to know, usually about what that project is and how, how it works. Do they have a, a real advisory board? I don't know if you guys remember this. If you guys have been around since 2017, 2018, since that era, you may have seen this hilarious ICO. This was a real ICO that used Ryan Gosling's face as one of their advisors and just renamed the guy. Uh, hilarious, right? But you, if you see that, you know that project's BS. Find a team that has real advisors who are actually contributing value, and it's not just a name on their website to make them look like they have clout. Communication is huge for me, right? If they're reaching out consistently uh, on a weekly or at least a monthly basis through blogs, videos, going on podcasts, those types of things, and actually giving updates on what's happening in the company or the project, that's a big deal. A history of success, especially in this industry, can tell you a lot about whether or not this project has the legs to survive, right? The bear market of 2017 wiped out 90 2% of the market, maybe more. Most of those projects are defunct, failed, gone. Maybe the community has picked it up or whatever, but they're for the most part dead. And you can go on deadcoins.com or one of those sites to see how many of those projects failed. If you made it out of that, if you're a project that started in 2017 or even before that, and you're still around and you're still growing, that's probably an indication that you're gonna go the distance. And you can check how much progress is actually being made with these projects because most of them are open source. If you go on their GitHub, how many times has their GitHub been updated recently? How many projects are they actively working on? Now this doesn't tell you everything you need to know about their development progress because a lot of teams do end up doing things in private, um, but at the same time, it is a big deal. Sometimes they'll have a roadmap on their website as well if they're doing private development. Okay, now once you're through all of that, what does this project actually do? Does it have a real utility or purpose? And why does it have this purpose? Is that a real business case or a real use case? Or is it just another money grab? I see a lot of projects recently coming out and, and they have these amazing concepts and ideas, but there's nothing really tangible about it. And there's definitely no business case. It's just kind of like a, a cool idea that's sort of in the early stages of development. So you wanna look for those things as well. And once you determine all of those things and you feel confident, then you can ask yourself, how am I getting my money back? What's the potential ROI? And if I do get the money back, is it real money? Is it real crypto coming back to me? Or is it just on paper, I'm now a millionaire and I can go and pretend that I'm, I'm rich. You wanna make sure that the profits are liquid and real. Um, how much time do we have? Like, okay. Um, so we are running slightly low on time. Uh, I could go through a Q and A if that's, wanted um, or I can uh, keep going. You guys tell me. I can't actually. You, you can keep going. You have eight minutes. Um, okay. If you still have more content to get through. We can save maybe the last few minutes for Q&A. Okay. Well, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at Divi then, if that's cool. Um, you know, one of the biggest deals for us as a company is creating world-class hybrid cryptocurrency opportunities for people. Um, and it's not just about crypto, right? It's a hybrid ecosystem. What does that mean? What we aim to do and what we are doing is to consolidate the value chain of all digital finance. So that means you should be able to buy and sell Bitcoin as well as store fiat currencies and send them all over the world as well as set up masternodes and stake and do all the things that make crypto the beautiful opportunity that it is. So what we've done is we've created uh, basically a FinTech arm of our project. In uh, the early part of, or the late part of 2019, we purchased a FinTech operation that was at the time a remittance company. Um, and with our investment, we were able to, to turn that company into a, um, basically a fully fledged, we can't say bank, <laughs> but it, it basically is an, uh, an organization that can issue international bank account numbers, debit cards, um, and facilitate the funds, uh, the transfer of funds worldwide. Um, and that also means that we can operate 
an exchange all within this one beautiful user experience. Um, so that's kind of what I've been working on for the past year or so um, is this what we call Divi Pay application. Uh, when this launches, you'll actually have the opportunity to associate your name with your address. Uh, if you choose, you don't have to. Um, you can associate a picture with it, uh, your email if you like, pretty much any of the normal metadata that exists in your typical internet accounts can be associated with your address. What this does for you is allows you to easily transition between any of our software products, whether that be the desktop or mobile wallet or anything that comes out there uh, moving forward. But it also allows you to easily search your friends, um, send money to them without having to deal with, you know, the addresses, um, long strings of numbers and letters, um, and have more of like a, a PayPal experience. Um, I actually did have a, a screenshot up, but I lost it. No worries. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's basically what we've been working on building over the past year, because as I said, during my presentation, it's really important for especially masternode coins to have a use case. It, a lot of the masternode coins have died because they were just basically Ponzi schemes. They, you know, only did one thing, which was create more coins. And until you have more people to buy those coins, it just becomes uh, a, basically a Ponzi scheme in the making. We were and are committed to not having that happen. And we've seen that we already have a lot of use cases on online in the physical world. Um, and we believe that more will come online as we integrate this hybrid infrastructure. Well, Coin Genius would agree with you on that. We've been watching you guys in the market and uh, before our head of market research uh, knew who Divi was. He was like, so I checked out all the master node coins and the top two performers are this thing called Dash and D-I-V-I. And we're like, that's Divi. <laughs> so we were like, so, is there getting this like organic traffic because of, because of the use case? It, it really is amazing. You know, for me, I look at it as a Darwinian science observer of like, all right, it's, you know, you either, you either live or die on the beach, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it's great to see you guys thriving. Thank you. means a lot. Well, Nick, well done, sir, as always. Thank you, sir. Thank yep. you for having me, man. I really appreciate yeah. the opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Well, if anybody has any other questions, uh, please let Nick know. Nick, uh, I don't know if you shared this already, but uh, where can people get a hold of you? Where should they follow Divi? Yeah, um, come join us. All our social medias are just at Divi Project, including Telegram. If you want to reach out to me specifically, you can find me on Telegram or on Twitter at NSAP Productions. Awesome. Well, with that said, we'll go ahead and pivot to the next one. Thanks again for all the support and we'll talk to you soon.